Great morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Interdependence Salon number three, brought to you by Metabolic Studio. Metabolic Studio explores self-sustaining and self-diversifying systems of exchange that feed emergent properties that regenerate the life web. Just a quick note before we begin, we will be recording today's conversation for Metabolic Studio's archive on YouTube. So if you don't wanna be seen, turn off your camera by pressing the button um, at the left corner of your screen. We're also gonna keep everyone on mute until question time, which I'll kick off about halfway through our event today. If you happen to have any questions while the conversation is happening, please write them down in the chat or digitally raise your hand through Zoom and, I'll call, and somebody will call on you to speak during the question and answer period. Before we begin, we would like to play a documentary film trailer, The Seeds of Vandana Shiva. Thank you for joining us. Food is a weapon. They said when you sell real weapons and arms, you control armies. When you control food, you control society. When you control seed, you control life on earth. It just so happens that throughout history, in every culture, it's women who kept the seed. I'm born in the Himalayan forest, and uh, non-separation from nature was quite clearly a lesson. We had a classroom out in those forests. I chose as a young child to do physics even though the schools I went to didn't offer it because for me physics was about understanding how the world works. So at the end of it I did a PhD in foundations of quantum theory and it's quantum theory that taught me how to make connections. Because of my book, I got invited to a biotech meeting where I realized what the industry wanted to do with the seed, which is to take control of the seed through patenting. That's when I started. I took a commitment to start saving seeds, but I also realized it's not enough to talk anymore. Got to do it. 40% of the solution to climate change lies in organic ecological farming in the hands of small farmers. I can't wait for governments and corporations to make the shift. People must. A GMO forced on people without a label is a criminal act. Monsanto is proud to be the industry leader in agricultural innovation. Monsanto sneaked into the budget law a clause that no court could ever rule against them. We're committed to helping farmers double yields by 2030. GMOs haven't produced more. There's only one way. Ecological farms, small farms. And yet, we get the propaganda. Without GMOs, people will starve. Without chemicals, people will starve. We have enough innovation and technologies to grow more food without killing our farmers. You have to throw the light of disclosure in order to break these secret bonds between manipulated officials, manipulated GMOs and manipulated science. This is Gandhi, seven social sins. Politics without principles, wealth without work, pleasure without conscience, worship without sacrifice. If I hadn't felt the imperative to come back to India, both to answer the puzzle of the disconnect between big science and big poverty, 
as well as just the surge to give back. I didn't know how I could, but I had to give back. Why does she drive you nuts? <laughs> Hi, I'm Millie. And I had a great opportunity to be there when Dr. Vandana Shiva came to visit us a few months ago. And I thought I'd start this rather than introducing Lauren's long list of accomplishments to say that there was a moment on something that's really hard for us to communicate, which is how to give value to something that has been invisible. The floodplain has been buried under the Los Angeles Concrete River for over 75 years. Last September, we lifted it out and saved it from going to the landfill. It looks like sand, silt, and river rocks. We spent the last seven months studying, sampling, and trying to advocate for it because it is real and it's definitely alive. And when Dr. Vandana Shiva witnessed the floodplain, there was an aha moment that there is an intersection between living systems, science, and art. That's the genesis of today's conversation, is how do we co-create with the life web in meaningful ways where we have one foot in the art world and another foot in building a future for ecological art that is not all about creative mind. It's about our observational mind and thinking of ourselves as stewards of our house, which we call planet Earth. I'd like to now introduce to you the president of Friends of Navdanya, Mary Jacobs, who will introduce today's guest, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Thank you, Millie. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Vandana Shiva, who I've known for many years. And what I find so special about Vandana is her heart, her compassion for people and for the earth and all its living beings and connections. And I'm amazed at her deep intelligence and her remarkable capacity to make connections among seemingly disparate ends of life, be it art, science, agriculture, the floodplain there in Los Angeles, technology, with the results that she always surprises, engages, and challenges me to look at the world differently, to think in new ways, act on what I know. And she is just brilliant, generous, concrete. 30 years ago, she founded the Navdani movement in India with the goals of protecting the rights of seeds to reproduce themselves, not to be genetically engineered, and the rights of small farmers to be able to grow and save and exchange their own seeds and not be controlled by seed companies. And by the way, Navdanya has two meanings in the Hindi it means nine seeds. It also means new gift. Vandana created a biodiversity conservation farm, which you saw a bit of in the opening video, to demonstrate how agroecological farming practices, farmers to produce their own seeds and food while maintaining the biodiversity in a local area. And on that farm, which also has a seed bank, Vandana and her team have really been able to demonstrate and document scientifically the many benefits of these farming practices that such as the increased nutrition value of food, 
that's been grown in fields that have had applications of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. And the farm is also the home of the Earth University. And it teaches and trains hundreds of farmers, men and women from throughout India, as well as visitors from around the world. Navdanya has grown into an international movement organized around key themes, agroecology, seed freedom for health and climate resilience. And within this context, the movement represented in the United States by Vidanya takes campaigns like the current campaign for poison-free, fossil fuel-free agriculture to create a sustainable future. Through her work, Vandana is really inviting us to create an earth democracy, a democracy where earth itself, its seeds, its organisms, have right along with human beings, and a democracy in which we see ourselves as ecological citizens actively creating a just, biodiverse, sustainable world. There are many paths towards this democracy, and I'm looking forward to this conversation with Vandana and Lauren to see where it's going to lead us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for those beautiful uh, introductions, Millie and Mary. And thank you so much to Brooklyn Rail for co-hosting today and bringing the American coast, the East and the West, um, through time and space across an ocean um, to India um, to talk about the interdependence between us all. So let me start by Offering to you, dear Vandana, a bouquet picked under full Thank moonlight. You. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this bouquet um, was grown in the floodplain of the LA River. These are native seeds that were able to, after six months of care, support plants that would have grown there more than a hundred years ago. And also just wanted to acknowledge all the ancestors that cultivated that land way before Los Angeles was there and to feel by holding this bouquet something very tangible to honor the ancestors that were, that were there before me, before us. And to just talk for a moment about your ancestors since I'm talking about mine and asking you to tell us a little bit about where are you right now and what is the tangible reality that you can tell us about the space you're in, the place you're in? Well, I am locked down in a, a place with lovely memories. Um, it's my mother's cow shed, which she handed over to me in 1981, when I was hesitating between continuing in an academic world or giving myself to full service to the earth and communities. And my mother said, don't hesitate, take the cow shed, be free. And, uh, and this building used to have her cows, straw to feed them. And I, you know, for us, the family of cows was not just an extended family, but I all, you know, we used to always feel my mother gave more love to the cows than to us because we were rebellious teenagers and the cows were just loving unconditionally. Um, so I'm in my childhood home in Dehradun um, and uh, otherwise I would be traveling or be in Delhi. Uh, um, and uh, it's about the best place where I would spend two, three, four, five months of being locked down. And I'm increasingly feeling... Uh, you know, not just totally grateful to my ancestors, um, grateful to the lovely forests they created inside a city. It's the only green patch left. And so all the birds come here and all the butterflies come here and uh, the monkeys come here. And because we've deprived wildlife so badly, our monkeys even ate the onions the other day. <laughs> and you know, everyone's talking about animals coming back. 
But I think we need to be also thinking of how much space we took away from the animals. And uh, that, you know, they're also our ancestors. Uh, you know, whether you look at evolutionary theory and say we descended from the monkeys or we think of Earth family and Earth democracy, as Mary talked about. So all the ancestors have contributed to us. And, and being back home, uh, you know, I'm deeply aware of everything that has shaped me because 40 years ago, I started all this. And um, life's been a big journey of a lot of movement. Some of the, you know, the film showed how I was just zipping around from this place to that. That last scene was the climate conference at, um, at Copenhagen. We were already talking about taking care of the soil as the solution to the climate change. So it's good to be here. It's good to be talking to you, Lauren. It's good to be talking to the two coasts of the US. And thank you, Mary, and thank you, Millie. Thank you. You know, yesterday we had a minute to talk about this kind of expanded field of us being both sort of in place right now because of COVID, but also through your understanding of quantum physics and your practice of being able to write. We're also thinking about the interconnectedness of everybody that is sheltering in place. And it's almost as if it's a built model of non-locality in quantum <laughs> physics and how that underpins interdependence. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this idea of thinking not so much about the dominant way of speaking about social distancing as a way of thinking about physical distancing with the potential for great interdependence and freedom for a moment to consider that interdependence, not just to humans, but to all living systems and all living systems that made us and got us to this point. So, you know, mechanical physics, which is what the physical distance is about, you know, you are an entity there and six feet apart, I'm another entity here. That physical distancing. In fact, I think the term social distancing should be illegal to use. Because even the WHO had to back off and say, no, no, social distancing is a wrong term. But there are those who would like to craft a new separation. And long ago, I did a book with my friend, um, Maria Mies on ecofeminism. And one of the chapters in that book is from the individual to the individual that everything's being constantly broken up and fragmented. So the mechanical physics, the classical physics is really about separation and fixed entities that can't move on their own. You have to put pressure to make them move. So it's called action at a distance, uh, uh, action by contact. Whereas in quantum theory, we realize that no matter how far apart particles are, they are interconnected. They are non-separable. That's where non-locality comes into the picture. But ecological systems recognize that too. That's why we have this thesis in chaos theory of a butterfly in the Amazon. You know, wings can create a storm somewhere else. And uh, not only does this interdependence and interconnectedness mean that we can be physically isolated and separated right now, but the amazing interconnectedness that is part of being, you know, it's part of being on this planet, on this earth, in this universe. And our interconnectedness is not only just with other humans, but with all of life, with all of life. And today, as we were talking, today is the day of Buddha, the full moon of Buddha. And in Buddhism, everything is a sentient being. And because of that, compassion is a broad compassion for all life. And dharma is treading lightly on the earth. And in a way, we've been given a pause from this illusion of the fast pedal. Uh, and I want to just tell you a, a small story. Um, you know, I, I grew up think, looking for freedom as we always do. And of course, as a young feminist, nothing smarter than get into my dad's fiat and drive around town. And I should be very, very proud. And then I went to Canada and, uh, you know, on the weekends, I found the whole campus was totally empty and everyone was running away somewhere. Yeah. 
300 miles away for a party, 500 miles away for a party. And I said, why is everyone wanting to escape all the time? Why can't people just be? And so I started to see the automobile as a prison of escaping, you know, from life. And I stopped driving. I, I stopped driving since that time. And my love for the automobile just collapsed. Mm-hmm. And in a way, the lockdown has, um, has broken everyone's love and obsession with the automobile by force, not by choice. And I think post COVID, we should make it a choice to see when is it necessary? Yes. To use yes. an automobile. When is it necessary to, uh, you know, this, I think the whole, I think what fossil fuel, the fossil fuel age gave us, colonialism uprooted people, you know? It forced people to be uprooted from their home. People didn't choose to be uprooted. But the fossil fuel age gave us this idea of escape, that home was no more worth being in, yeah? You had to go away somewhere else. And I look at the billionaires, some of them are not billionaires anymore. I mean, poor Virgin Atlantic, he was going to finance one-way trips to Mars and he's having to be bailed out. Virgin has collapsed and, you know, Virgin Australia has stopped uh, flying and, he, and the bailout is becoming a big issue for him. But Elon Musk wants to fly off to the moon, I think. Someone else wanted to go to Mars. And Elon Musk even had a thing, and I have it in my book, Oneness Versus One the One Percent, where... He's saying, I have figured out how to take, <laughs> I figured out how to take a, Pepsi, uh, a pizza hut to Mars. Of course, he has figured out how to grow food. You know, you with your floodplain um, of the Los Angeles River are being able to grow all these plants. And, um, and this idea of escape is so deep. In the colonizing spirit, I, without taking too much time, I don't know if I can find. Yes, I found it. So Cecil Rhodes is, is the one who colonized what was called Rhodesia and is now called Zimbabwe. And this is what he's saying. We must find new lands from which we can easily obtain raw materials and at the same time exploit the cheap slave labor that is available from the natives of the colonies. The colonies would also provide a dumping ground for the surplus goods produced in our factories. That's a few centuries ago, but exactly the same process carries on. So I think this being home, being in place, you know, um, I think that we should change social distancing and only talk physical distancing and sheltering at home should become a sheltering on the earth, sheltering in our place, getting rooted again. That is the moment yes. that, you know, that deeper, we have to take every term they've created to confuse us and root it right back in the earth and reclaim our freedoms. Beautiful. I want to, again, uh, sort of bring up words themselves. And one of the things that you spoke so clearly about in Oneness and One Present is the root of the word ecological in the Greek term for home. Um, And that economics was the way of balancing the economy of the home. So now that we're rooted in place, um, rethinking our relationship each individually to our home and what the way forward is in reinventing from the colonization of our mind, which is the next uh, potential frontier that you warn against, um, take the power back by understanding what your real capacity is to reconnect to your home, Mother Earth, which is comprised of every living thing that's ever been here in a great mix. So I wondered if you could talk about ecological thinking and connected to deep rootedness at home and how that could be a portal to all of us being reconnected through that connection. So, you know, Gaia and Oikos as home um, is of course the particular places where we are, but it's also the earth, which is our common home. And, um, 
And that's the beauty of it. Because in being home on the earth, there is no competition and conflict between the local and the planetary. Both are home. Yeah? Because usually otherwise you're always having to sacrifice the local for the global economy. And there is no contradiction between the economy and ecology. Today, we've had another gas leak in India. I don't know why all the gas leaks come to India. I think it's partly to remind us that we don't really have to go the toxic, hazardous industrial way. There are better ways we can take care of our home. Today, about 11 or 12 people have died because a plastic factory leaked to gas. And, um, and it's just the beginning. We don't know how many more will die. But uh, taking care of our home means taking care of every being. As you said, that's why I talk of Earth, us being one Earth family. And um, the rupture in this earth family was with colonialism and industrialism, the idea that humans are superior to other species, anthropocentrism, but also what I have called ecological apartheid. The word apartheid is the Boer word for separation. Yeah, The same word that comes up all the time in a mechanistic way of thinking. Uh, I call it ecological apartheid because this construct that we are separate from nature is a construct because we cannot be separate. I mean, if we were, we wouldn't breathe. We'd be dead. We wouldn't have water. You've just had water. I've got my little water here. We'd be dead of thirst. If we were separate, we wouldn't have the nourishing things the earth gives us to nourish our bodies. So whether it's the food or the water or the breath, or our life force interconnected, we are one. And the diversities, the beautiful bouquet of flowers you were showing me, diversity is the nature of life in its free evolution, in its self-organized evolution. You know, nothing that is free becomes identical to something else that's free. You know, it, it becomes unique unto itself, sharing through its uniqueness and diversity the common home of which they are a part, but the common life, which is the web of life. But it's that same process of separation from the earth, the anthropocentrum, we are superior to other species, which then created racism born exactly at the same time, that white Europeans are superior to blacks and browns and we were rendered barbarian. Color, instead of being celebrated as diversity, suddenly became a problem for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> color is the artistic quality of life on earth, including the, the different colors of the human beings. Whole idea of patriarchy, married to making money and commerce, capitalist patriarchy, I call it, that women are inert just like the earth is inert. They're just passive. And then with this, the idea that some religions are superior, and it is very strange that you know, these colonial roots of violence, justification of violence, are in a coming way, just like you know, primitive accumulation, scratch, rob, rob, rob is coming back. You know, this superiority, the white superiority, yeah. is bursting back in its sense of inferiority, in its sense of uh, you know, the world changing too fast. Yes, and I want to bring back something that um, I heard in one of your lectures, the one you did recently at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard to uh, women in design when you talked about grandmother's university, uh, grandmother's learnings, and how women and their stories about the connection to the earth and to the seed were literally dispossessed by patenting seeds and marginalizing all of that knowledge. So one of the commons is the commons of our narratives and the commons of, you know, we've experienced it here on the continent of North, and, North America, not just by the um, genocide that the Native Americans have faced, but the epistemicide that went with it, the eradication of their knowledge from the field, which is now our only way, as far as I can see, forward is to reconnect the knowledge field 
of indigenous and especially women's stories. And I think that's why the power structure wants to keep us apart. And, and you, talk, you talked to me yesterday about your um, future vision and in a way one of your ancestors and that was Gandhi and the idea of how to resist from a peaceful position the controlling ideologies that are wreaking havoc on women's lives, on people of color's lives, um, on the radically dispossessed from the economic opportunities to even survive. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, Satya Gre and, um, and your idea of truth and force and the power that we have even in our confinement to find oneness where they want to divide us. So I, I think for understanding Satyagraha, the power of truth, um, it's, it's useful to recognize that our histories and our stories of colonialism are interconnected. You know, the empire, the, the British empire was an empire of cotton. Yeah. And um, it's interesting right now, while in, you know, in this whole shutdown, half of India, which has become migrant labor, wanting to go home to their villages as the factories stop working, as urban economies shut down, they're all wanting to go home. Some started to walk. The others who wanted to have arrangement by trains were told, no, you can't leave. So they're like in captivity. And you know the word that's being used is the word that used to be used when the British used to capture Indian to take them to South Africa, you know? And that's the way they took them to, if you wonder why the West Indies has so many Indians, you know? They were taken in the same way. There's a word for it called Girmitya. But Africans were taken, you know? You, there's a big movement, Black Lives Matter. But I think Black Lives Matter is connected. Absolutely. To the same process that um, tried to separate South Africa on the basis first of ra you know, race imposed on Indians, and then in about four, 30 years later on the blacks. Um, because earlier, they, you know, they just grabbed the lands of the Africans. So they didn't need to do anything, but the Indians were coming there, not just as professionals, but as traders. And they were getting free after five years of being bonded. But the, you know, the genocide of the indigenous people, <coughs> Cindy's here with us, 90% wiped out. So when we think of today's pandemic, imagine what was done with introducing all kinds of pathogens. And the violence, you know, they, people used to, because I read this a lot, and people used to be paid to bring the heads of indigenous people. And people who brought the head of a baby got half the money as for an adult's head. And when you think of the fact that that brutalization in a way never went away because those who were engaged in that violence were rewarded and they think they'll carry on forever. So coming back to Satyagraha, in South, you know, Gandhi went to England to study law and then someone when he came back to India, they wanted him to go for a case to South Africa. So he went to South Africa. And in the process, he got involved in community activities. So they passed an Indian act saying Indians could not uh, study. They could not trade. That they had to, have to have to have a certificate. And this certificate had to be carried all the time. And the police could enter your home without permission to check your certificates. And so, you know, Gandhi and the Indian community got together and said, but this is taking away our citizenship and we are all citizens. So the first Satyagraha, which is the civil disobedience that Gandhi led, was against these laws of race, racial discrimination in South Africa. And out of it grew the thing that we are one citizenry. Just the fact that we are different colors doesn't make us unequal. We are equal human beings. 1906, they started it. 
1911, the British had to back off and give them the recognition of equality. Then he came back. And by then, there was compulsory cultivation of indigo. He went there. And the peasants were saying, we'd rather die than grow indigo under slave conditions. Because people were starving to death. They weren't allowed to grow their own food. That was the next satyagra. The salt. The British wanted to monopolize salt making. And in a tropical country, you need salt. So I took inspiration from there when they said, oh, seed will be our monopoly. Yeah. I said, if we could have a satyagra for salt, where Gandhi walked, he, he did a long march, the salt march, went to the sea, picked up the salt from the sea, and said, nature gives it for free. We need it for our survival. We will continue to make salt. We will not obey your laws. And took inspiration from that and said, you can write any law you want to, but nature and our ancestors and our grandmothers have given us these seeds. It is our duty to protect them in their diversity, their integrity, their freedom for future generations. So we will not accept your seeds that destroy our diversity and we will not obey your laws. And I started that in 87 and we were able to shape laws where our Indian laws actually recognize that seeds are living and seeds are not inventions. And we have an article 3J which says, plants, animal and seeds cannot be patentable. And I think across the world, we all need new movements to say what is a commons, what is creation, and therefore, what are the commons that can't be enclosed? And what is the hijack of creation that cannot be patented? I think the issue of medicine is going to become very, very, very important. Um, so coming back to the Satyagra issue, I just want to uh, share with you, because, you know, Thoreau, when, when there was um, slavery in, um, in, North, in, uh, in, in the Americas, Thoreau refused to pay the poll tax, which is the way they used to support slavery. And he went to jail for a day. And he said, the only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think is right. That's Satyagra. Then he goes on to say, law doesn't mean it's the right thing. So your conscience has to be the guide. And Gandhi called Satyagra the force of truth as a no to unjust law from your deepest conscience. And that's what connects us. He also recognized, and he said, as long as the superstition exists that unjust laws must be obeyed, so long will slavery exist. So we are at this moment where there's all the history and narratives of past slavery there is the new lockdown, yeah? There is a, a thinking that we can create new slaveries. Now the slavery of the mind. And I think what the Satyagraha of today is, is taking all the rivers of the different cultures, the different races, and like you took the commons of the Los Angeles River and brought it out, we should take all these hidden stories, all these forgotten histories, and then bring them into one, one, you know, all the tributaries joining into one mighty river of one humanity on one planet. That we are diverse, but we will not be divided. We are off the earth and we will not be separated. And my little suggestion is that out of our dialogue today, everyone who's participating should go home and talk to their circle, to their community, to say what are our histories, what are our narratives that we need to reclaim? Yeah? What are the oppressions that we have to say no to? And 2nd of October is Gandhi's birth anniversary. It's also called the day of Satyagraha, the day of speaking your truth. And if we do it in unity across the world in an artistic way, 
with the ultimate humanity at a time where speed, there are people, and I think I study them quite a bit, <laughs> the people who would like us to totally lose our humanity, you know, forget what being alive is. Because at one level, you know, this fear of each other, you know, this it's created a new untouchability in India. I know it's created a new untouchability around the world. Oh, contagions, contagion, contagion, you know? And, uh, and worse, you know, we're doing what we shouldn't be doing. We're constantly using chemicals to cleanse ourselves. And when we should allow the diversity of microbes to bring us the immunity and work with our bodies, we are walking microbes actually, you know? We are viruses and our gut microbiome is 60 trillion microbes. So not only should this river be of diversity of humans, but diversity of all beings, from the microbes to the plants and all the animals and the big mammals and the insects in between. You know, we, we did a festival last year with children and we just, I just told the schools, you decide how you'll celebrate biodiversity. It was quite amazing. They all dressed up as their particular species, the bee, the earthworm. And I think what we should do is real people, Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Matter, Women's Lives Matter, Children's Lives Matter, the climate matters, the seed matters, the water matters, the soil matters, our food matters. Reclaim it all as a commons. And let's just have celebrations everywhere on 2nd October. So yes, this is the outcome of uh, Dr. Shiva and I's conversation yesterday is that we're um, going to co-conspire on a massive uh, Zoom platform conversational web uh, from now until the culmination on October 7th, Dr. Gandhi's, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's birthday to reclaim our power and our interdependence with all, uh, all living systems around us in a great massive oneness and to take back all that we have allowed to dispossess ourselves from and all those who have been politically or economically dispossessed as part of our home, as part of there should be no unhoused, there should be no untouchables, there should be no disrespect for people who have been othered. Um, and these brutalities go on daily. There's uh, many fights happening here in North America today, which we'll go through in our shout outs. Um, but just to say, we need to find back to that quantum physics idea, right? that the truth is in the relativity of our place to everything else. Every living system that has ever been or will be, time itself is curved. Yes, yes. And don't be distracted by the buffoonery of the main media and politics, which is so absurd that it doesn't really warrant our attention. So. I, I, I would love before we open it up for you to talk about what um, this, this area of the freedom of mind and how to keep your head with all of this noise going on that's feeding us with fear about our own mortality, uh, fear of each other as specimens of contagion rather, you know, and, and um, how do we move through that and maintain the freedom of mind to co-create the next step in human evolution? So, you know, this whole, you know, the, what quantum theory grew as an alternative to was the mechanistic phys physics, the classical physics, which then became the way all disciplines shaped themselves. And I've always been amazed by two fragmentations of the human being, yeah? That we have a brain here that thinks and the body is dead. You know? <laughs> and, and since women don't have brains, when, when Mary was at Mount Holyoke, I remember I had to, I think I came for the 150th anniversary. She was the international dean there. And I was just reading literature in the women's colleges there, Smith, Mount Holyoke, it was amazing in the archives I read that there was a big debate about women's colleges. And it was said that if the girls start to study, their brain will grow and the uterus will shrink and they'll become bad 
reproductive machines. So, you know, the head was, the brain was put here and our bodies were made inert and dead. But, you know, when I was having my baby, I was reading all these books and I couldn't believe every textbook of gyne gynecology has a pregnant woman with a womb, but the baby's never inside her. The baby's always outside her. And so I said, it's not an accident that you've got this crazy war in America of pro-choice and pro-life when there's only one interdependent life. <laughs> we should never have been splitting these things. So the interconnectedness of this body and mind, and in Indian philosophy, you know, the body is in the mind because it's the mind that connects. In you know, the plants have a mind, the insects have a mind, that water in Los Angeles River has its mind, and that mind and consciousness is the connector. Within it is a very intelligent body where every cell in our being is alive. It has a mind. Every microbe in our gut has a mind. And therefore, when we abuse our bodies with chemicals, when we abuse our bodies with junk food, you know, we are robbing them. We are robbing the, the body of its mind. And therefore, you also get a situation where one cell starts to go crazy and becomes a cancer cell. So I've always said, not knowing when to stop is the logic of a cancer cell. Mm -hmm. Every living system knows how to grow and how to die and grow and die with life as a um, So all of life is intelligent. And the mechanistic thought right now is not just that how does become new minds? It's quite amazing, you know? I don't know how many of you are reading the literature on what's going on in the medical field with, um, with the corona, where they're literally taking patents already, even before they have found the antibodies, they're already taking patents on our bodily activity. And they're calling it mining data, not just from our bodies, but also from our minds. So when there's a communication, right now we are talking, yeah? Some mine this data, process it through an algorithm, which is just a, 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 a algebraic, an equation, process it, turn it into what they call big data, sell it back to us. So what are we talking about right now? We're talking about a perpetuation of the colonial Cartesian industrial idea of the body as just an empty container, now added to the construction that ordinary human beings' minds are empty containers. First, they're minds from which we take the data, but then they're empty containers to which we sell the data. And this is where our subcategory has to be, that we, our autonomous, sovereign, knowing minds. We are interbeings. You know, when you talked about interconnectedness, we are interbeings. There's no way we can say, I end here, my brain ends here. That chopping up, you know, is so, so violent to the reality of a living, vibrant world. So we have to right now start saying, no, I, I'm intelligent. My body's intelligent. My gut is intelligent and my community is intelligent, and let us not allow the colonization of our bodies or our minds. That will be the next colonization if we allow it to happen. That's why it needs a Satyagraha. That's why it needs all of us to rise in one common freedom of all life on earth. Well, I, I, I think that's a good moment to segue into some of the questions that um, our, our, our audience might have for you. Thank you so much um, for sharing some of your thoughts. And I'll be My back pleasure. with you on the question bar. Bees, do you want to take it on? Sure. Thanks, Lauren. And thanks, Dr. Shiva. Uh, the first question we have is from Caroline Jones. So Caroline, if you're there, I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask your question directly. Thank you so much for hosting this forum. It's extraordinary to be present in this digital way. My question, Dr. Shiva, is about the extraordinary lawsuit that you participated in on behalf of Pashamama in the Ecuadorian Constitution. And um, I'm fascinated by this legal stratagem, which of course is very Gandhi-esque, 
And I wonder if you could think with us about these structures of law and how we can speed them up in changing the patterns that are so destructive. Thank you. So, you know, um, that film that you saw and I'm at the, at the Copenhagen summit, at that summit, even before the negotiations ended, President Obama came and sat with India, China, I think Russia, sat with five of the big polluters and said, why do we have to obey a law? You know, let's just agree to do voluntary reductions and announced it. So President Boliv uh, uh, Eva Morales of Bolivia was inside the negotiations. And he said, we're still negotiating and we were here to protect the rights of Mother Earth, not to protect the rights of polluters. So he said, I'm going to go back to Bolivia and call a citizens gathering. And out of that grew this draft declaration of the rights of Mother Earth. But before that, Ecuador had rewritten its constitution. And I was, you know, I was invited by the president who, who for his inauguration and I couldn't go. But he said, your book, Staying Alive has inspired me that the earth is living. It's a simple fact. We all need to recognize that the earth is living and she has her laws. If the rulers are too stupid to understand her sophistication, it's not the earth's problem, it's their problem. And therefore, as a world community, with the, what we have to do is where, A, there's a law written by the earth, yeah? That life renews, life is diverse, there's biodiversity, there's water, there's soil, there's the atmosphere. Then there's a law of humanity. And this is what the UN Human Rights Declaration is about, that all human beings are equal. You know, wars have been fought on, on false assumptions of inferiority and superiority, but all human beings are equal. So some countries had turned this into national law. And because Ecuador had it in national law, what happened is when the BP, spill took place in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know, some of us decided since there's a constitutional court there, let's file a case based on the rights of the earth on BP on behalf of the earth. Yeah. And I just want to say that these laws of the earth are permanent, but there's such a fear in the colonizing empire that they pulled Eva Morales down they pulled the government down that, uh, that wrote the constitution. So, you know, the beauty about life is things get born and some things die, but that doesn't mean the, the processes of a higher law die. Human articulation of them might phase out for a little time. There's a brilliant case from uh, Australia. So in Australia, you know, the Aboriginals were the first farmers. 60,000 years ago, they were farming. 60,000 years ago. They weren't Bushmen, they were farmers. And then there was a case, of course, the British took away all their rights. And the case said, rights that come from the earth can never be extinguished. They can be denied, but they can't be extinguished. Of course, there's a, their rights are being Denied again, there's a whole new biggest power plant and coal plant of the world is being created there. And Aboriginal rights have been taken away in the court cases everywhere. But I think we always have to work in three planes. The rights of Mother Earth, which are in the laws of her seed, of her water, of her soil, of her atmosphere. The rights of humanity, whether they're in the human declaration or they're in our relationship of oneness and interdependence. And then there are their laws on paper. So the laws on paper can be undone as they are being undone in your country, in my country. You know, I just saw 60 environmental laws have been rubbished in America. And, uh, but that doesn't mean the laws of the earth have gone away. And when I talk of a Satyagraha on 2nd October of all of the streams coming together, it is really to allow people to recognize that at the end of the day, they, through their lives and their minds, write the laws that govern them. Thank you. The next question I'm going to call on is from Virginia Bryant. So Virginia, if you are here, I'm going to unmute you. 
Um, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I've lost track of my question and I probably missed too much of what was just said. Um, I've admired Dr. Shiva for a long time and I'm very happy to be a part of this and I want to continue to be a part of this movement. Um, there's a lot of fear in my world right now because of the oppression that threatens to take over the world through the power of um, using this, this uh, pandemic as a tool to further oppression, microchipping everybody, forcing people to take, uh, everybody to take vaccines that are damaging and not even really vaccines in the conventional sense. Um, you've talked a little bit about how to deal with these sort of strategies and I, I want to hear more and I want to hear it again and I want to be uh, a part of helping and not contributing to the fear, which I very much am in right now. And thank you, Dr. Shiva, for being here. I think the most important thing about fear is you don't internalize it, then it disappears. You know, the powerful have always used fear as an instrument of violence. And the minute you make it your own, they've already won in the conquest. That's why not getting contaminated, if there's one contagion that we need to resist, it's fear. And how do you resist fear? You resist fear through oneness, through love, through knowing we are interdependent. And for me, it's always, you know, when Monsanto said they're going to own all the seed of the world. And uh, of course, for a while, I was afraid. I said, my God, one company, and four companies wanted to own the seed of the world. The second part of what I've learned in life is when a big power wants to oppress through fear and control, what you do is your actions to stay free. So I started to save seeds. And my inspiration was one little poem. It said, I have one seed. I have one seed. You can destroy this and you can destroy that. I have one seed that I will plant again. And it's all right if it's just one seed. Because in that seed is still the non-local presence of all life. Therefore, we do what we can. So I always say we have to work with both hands. With one hand, we have to plant a seed and grow a garden. There is nothing more healing than growing a garden. And that should be another part of our celebration, Lauren, on the 2nd of October. Gardens of diversity everywhere. And our national anthem, which I, you know, I found out the fifth para only recently, so beautiful. Today's Tagore's birthday, not only is it Buddha uh, Purnima, but Tagore's birthday. And Tagore wrote this para. He says, people came from all over the world. The, uh, you know, the Christians came and the Muslims came and all over the world religions came. And we together wove garlands of love. So gardens of hope, gardens of love, gardens of diversity, and garlands of love. And the minute you start engaging in work with the earth, engaging in work with community, you start engaging in healing. You know, the fear evaporates like that. Because in this, you live your path. And that's a power no one can take away from you. Thank you. The next question is from Diego Zapata. Diego, I think you can unmute yourself. Okay, <clears throat> am I good audio-wise? Cool. Um, so Dr. Vandana Shiva, I had the privilege of being able to read a lot of your literature yesterday. Um, and a, a recurring theme that I kind of picked up on it was that I think it is safe to say that science as a belief system has historically been limited by its patriarchal and imperialistic origins. And it's, uh, 
implicit technical approach to solving a lot of the world's problems. And so my question to you is how can a young scientist support the movement against the commodification of nature and like the movement towards uh, seed sovereignty in this system? Yeah. First, you've got such a nice name, Zapata. <laughs> I've been to Zapata's birthplace and I've even got a Zapata award from the Mexican Senate. Um, give big admiration for that hero from Mexico. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm a scientist. I critique reductionist mechanistic science. And I critique doubly, you know, Lauren, you called it epistemicide. But even before that, you have this epistemic racism. You know, Mexican used that name when we were fighting biopiracy and patenting of seed. So this is epistemic racism, that the innovation of the farmer is not treated as knowledge and science. And the theft by Monsanto is suddenly treated as knowledge. And Mexico has just passed a law making it totally illegal for people to take patents on corn, on, in, on their indigenous corn, because there's so much diversity. So it's not, the issue is not science. It's the issue of a fragmented science that doesn't understand the living systems. Because living systems, you know, the real processes to understand lie in the relationships. They lie in the interdependence. And you can only understand that through co-creation. Whereas dead system analysis comes through fragmentation and chopping down. What happened because, you know, when you, when you reduce a living system to a part, you can then extract that part. So a reductionist mechanistic science becomes central to an exploitative extractive economy. Whereas a living science, it could be quantum theory, it could be ecology, it could be evolutionary biology. There's so many streams that understand the life of life. What they use science for is to say, how can I care better? Yeah. So one says, how can I exploit faster? The other says, how can I care better? So as a young scientist, to stop the commodification, you have to just practice the authentic science, which is ecological, which is about us knowing how we are at home in this home. Great. Um, the next question I'm calling on is Devanshi Bimijiani. I'm going to unmute you, Devanshi. Hello? There you are. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, sorry, um, my question to Dr. Shiva was um, how people in urban and suburban centers can take these beliefs and um, affect social political change with them. Um, the one way that my friends and I have started doing is, you know, by starting gardens everywhere that we can. But, you know, being in urban centers and suburban centers, there's this tightness, you know, it's very hard to find spaces to do it. Um, but we're really inspired by your work and by, you know, the Bolivarian constitution of plurinationalism and everything in order to, you know, keep this movement going, but just, you know, figuring out where to go from here is, you know, kind of hard. <laughs> yeah. So I think it comes back to the issue of non-locality, that if you think of the urban place, the city as separate from the country that supports it, then it becomes a very difficult problem to address. You know? How can I do everything within the city? But the city is not by itself, just like we are not by ourselves. The city is embedded in a larger country. Now, when it comes to water, huge planning takes place. Um, I know uh, Lauren has done an amazing work on on water and you know the Owens Valley and the mule track and amazing installations. Uh, but on food, we don't think of, like we, we are doing gardens now, but we don't think of where did our food come from. And uh, you know, when I met the mayor of Los Angeles, uh, as when I meet mayors anywhere, I say, it has to be part of your town planning to have a solidarity food economy with regions that surround you. And I call it a food shed. Like we have a watershed that supplies a city's water. 
a food shed that supplies the city's food. Now, that means we have to overcome three apartheids. The apartheid between the city and the country, yeah, yeah? that separation. Um, the second we have to overcome is the idea that food only grows far away. That's why gardens and cities become important. Because gardens, is, you know, the problem with the current food system is it's so wasteful. And that's why you have to raise the Amazon and burn it to grow GMO soya. It should be totally unnecessary. You have to destroy the prairies to make it the agrarian, you know, supply base for America. No. The, the two coasts would supply all of the good food for the Americas if we do it right. And my work is showing that the smaller the farm, the more it produces. The more biodiverse the farm, the more it produces. So actually, all farms should be like gardens. Gardens in balconies, gardens in terrorists, gardens in communities, but farms like gardens. And then, like the co-creation of self-organized systems, we need to start connecting to sit places around us. This also means new innovation on our part of getting rid of another hierarchy, the hierarchy between different kinds of investment. You know? Before colonization, before the East India Company was created, invest meant to take care. If I took care of the land, I was investing in the land. If I took care of my culture, I was investing in my culture. An East India Company changed the meaning to make profits. So it became, investment became about money and making profits. And we've got to get rid of that vocabulary because the currencies that connect us are the currencies of solidarity, the currency of food, the currency of life. And these are the systems that we have to make more circular, more intimate, and the garden is the best place to begin. But to expand it to the food shed of a city, where are you from? Are you in LA or are you in New York? Hello? Yeah. Where are you based? There you go. Um, I'm actually based out of Austin. We just moved. Oh. Um, oh. But I'm actually from India. I moved here from Gujarat like several years ago and I have a lot of exposure to village women in, uh, in Gujarat and you know their practices which is kind of what I'm trying to do here because the climate is so similar yeah yeah so wherever you are you know begin with your garden expand outwards to be you know circular links of gardens and expand outwards mm -hmm. and and through this you create new solidarities you know mm -hmm. you start working with town planners who want to do something differently with the municipal people you know wherever don't look for something to come from the skies. It never does. Right. Right. I always say bombs come top down. Dictatorship comes top, top down. Earth democracy grows from the bottom up. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so we have time for one more question um, coming from Fong Bui. Fong, I, I believe you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Dr. Shiba. Thank you, Lauren. Um, listen to you talking about forming, and I just couldn't help but to remember very clearly when I saw the, the Apu trilogy by Satita Ray. You know, that yes. beautiful movie depicting the young boy coming of age from childhood. And then the second state was education and then reaching his maturity as a young Bengali. How beautiful, how poignant it was in that sense, depicting with such dignity, you know, the form, the form land, the, the, the little child grown up to become a sophisticated cosmopolitan. And it re reminds me about so much education. I think when I begin now recently reading a great deal of John Dewey, his idea of self-adjusting democracy, because of its fragility, we have to always 
being mindful. And then I, um, now I'm thinking about also listening to you talking. I can't help but also think of Tagore, you know, who was born in 1861, eight years older than Gandhi. His idea of education was so immersive, the equivalent of global village in the best sense of, of the idea, multiracial, multilingual, multicultural situation. Despite all the acknowledging of economic discrepancy and political imbalance and whatnot, the reason I'm thinking about this all because I think education is the root. I've been teaching, I no longer am teaching, but my graduate students, they lost their instinct to protest. They have to analyze, they have to talk and think of themselves, among themselves. Whereas Greta Thunberg is a good example, 17 years old. She reacts immediately to the crisis of our global situation. And I think that's something to be say about there's some way when the specialization of higher education have a way of dividing us among ourselves. This is the, one of the crises of the cultural left that we've been facing. So my question is a bit long, but it should be short. How do we remedy and mobilize people? Because I'm saying this as part of what you are saying. Uh, in other words, when you mentioned about social distancing, I was very disturbed by it when Trump announced it on March 16, Monday. We immediately create the social environment, which is now you are on. Um, very honored to have you on with us. Immediately the next day, and I'm the least technological person, but we learn <laughs> how to person and use it to our, our, you know, our advantage, so to speak. So this is the way of doing it in the in the way that you express it. We have to mobilize different fields, not just art here, it, you know, where science is over there, uh, somewhere on between the, the art and humanity and the science community have to come together. They've been separated for too long. I would say it's in the 70s. So I feel this very urgent that we are now talking this, in this forum together. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you come back again? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, on the last point, uh, we have a Navdanya office also in Florence, which is the town of the Renaissance. And, yeah. you know, uh, people, uh, the, the artists, they were also the best scientists. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was no separation. It's, it's the so-called scientific revolution where they calculatedly said, in fact, in my book, Staying Alive, I have a section where I'm quoting from Bacon, who was called the father of modern science, but he was also the chancellor. So he was the money maker, but he was also deciding what would be the science. And he wrote a book, The Masculine Birth of Time. He said, we have to be masculine in our conquest of nature. Mm -hmm. We cannot think of ourselves as part of nature. So there was a conscious effort to build a science structure of separation and division and fragmentation. Um, at one deep level, Tagore understood this. He understood the colonizing mind. And when he created Shanti Niketan, which means both the uni University of Peace, but he also called it the University of the Forest. And I spent six months there because my PhD guide mm -hmm. was brought there to start a physics department. I went with him for six months and um, I spent a lot of time in the arts department, but Tagore wrote an essay on, on the University of the East and he said, we cannot imagine that knowledge will come out of brick and mortar. Yeah. Knowledge will come out of living with nature as our teacher. And this then, you know, there's a Schumacher College, one of the big colleges, green colleges of the world. Yeah. I, I go and teach there and I find out that Tagore had a hand in starting that by sending his secretary Elmas there. And the, the Earth University at the Navdanya farm that Mary mentioned about is also inspired that by that same idea of a learning which is not through separation and conquest, but a learning of peace and co-creation. And you cannot engage in that 
without being your full being. And that's why we talk, and this is also Gandhi's teaching, we talk about learning through head, heart, and hand, unified as beings integrated with other beings and interdependent on them. Yes, we have that model here in the United States. It's short-lived, but it was a very amazing school. It's called Black Mountain College, where scientists, dancer, painter, theater, poet were all together as a unity. And, but it was not a sufficient model. This is where I mentioned Dewey idea of self-adjusting democracy. Some reason when we reach democracy, we tend to get very lazy and we- No, 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 COVID will make sure. You can't be lazy anymore. COVID has made sure laziness is over forever. <laughs> But no laziness. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone's locked into their homes, but everyone is fully aware. The half of humanity, half of humanity has lost its livelihoods. According to the ILO, 3.3 billion people are working people. 1.9 among them have lost their work. Yeah. In India, 120 million have lost their work. Mm -hmm. And the UN is predicting 130 million hunger deaths, 300,000 per day. So I don't think this idea of complacency that, you know, we're a rich country and there's complacency. I don't think we can take that for granted. The turmoil in society is so deep. And our role is to be rooted, grounded, creative, collaborative, and and work in solidarity and not be overwhelmed by the you know dismantling of too many systems at, um, in, at such a fast rate yeah you're absolutely right thank you dr shiva thank you thank you for that thank question you. thank you for uh, uh, to everyone for all the questions and thank you for the folks who submitted questions that we're not having time to answer sorry about that um i'm going to turn it over now to my colleague red uh to give some uh shout outs Hey everybody, can you hear me? Awesome. Thanks so much Vendana and Lauren for all those inspiring ideas and an amazing discussion. Um, I'd love to give a big shout out to the Brooklyn Rail for hosting this much needed conversation on their daily new social environment. Um, so yeah, I would like to take this time to call to attention some things that are happening right at this very moment. Please check the chat bar uh, for the links. So first, the struggle of the Mashpee Wampanoag people in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, also known as the people of the first light and the first nation to come into contact with the pilgrims exactly 400 years ago. Today, the Mashpee are in court because the federal government is trying to disestablish their reservation and the little tribal territory they still have sovereignty over, setting a terrible precedent for other tribal lands across the country. This clearly shows the ongoing engagement of the US government in dispossessing tribal nations and ties the settler colonial history of this country right back to its origins. We'd also like to draw attention to the ongoing expansion of the petrochemical industry through indigenous territories during this pandemic, from the coastal gas link and trans mountain pipelines, going through Wet'suwet'en and Sowetmut territories in so-called British Columbia, to the ongoing construction of TC Energy's Keystone XL pipeline, transporting some of the dirtiest crude oil from the Alberta tar sands in Canada through indigenous lands all the way to Texas. Right now in Nebraska, the Nebraska leg of this pipeline is on the move despite a court ruling in Montana revoking permits for their part of the project. The petrochemical industry, despite oil being at its lowest point in history, is trying to take advantage of COVID-19 to push their pipelines through deepening the violence to First Nations and the global ecological crisis that we are all in. And finally, I would like to say, since I'm up in the Owens Valley, in Paiute Shoshone territory, that people should know where they get their water and appreciate at what cost it arrives at their taps. LA's Department of Water and Power occupies and extracts the vast majority of Paiute Shoshone tribal lands and waters, which flow down from the highest peaks of the Eastern Sierra, giving this valley its name, the land of flowing water. It is important to note that in 2020, LADWP will be extracting the highest amount of water in the last 30 years. And on the 15th of this month, the Standing Committee will meet, which will be our opportunity to give public comment. 
So next time you have a sip, let's think about it. Thank you for listening and let's try to build a better world. Water is life. Thanks. Thank you again, Lauren. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. Thank you, Bees. Thank you, Red. Um, I will now would like to introduce Cindy Alvitri. Uh, she will be sharing a beautiful poem with us today and I'll read her bio. Cindy Alvitri is a mother and a grandmother and has been an educator and artist activist for over three decades. She is a descendant of the original inhabitants of Los Angeles and Orange counties and served as the first woman chair of the Gabrielino Tongva Tribal Council. In 1985, she and Lorraine Siskwak co-founded Mother Earth Clan, a collective of Indian women who created a model for cultural and environment education. With particular focus on traditional art, in the late 80s, she co-founded Tiat Society, sharing in the renewal of their ancient maritime practices of the coastal island Tongva. It is my honor to introduce Cindy Alvitri. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, can you hear me? Everybody can hear? Okay. Meha atahum. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. It's um, an honor to be in your presence and also in the presence of all you human beings that are here in this, at this moment in time, in this breath. Um, and, and just grateful that everybody has renewed and in the process of renewing their relationship to the nature. Um, a couple of things before I read this poem, um, and I'm very, very happy that, um, Dr. Shiva, that you bring up our relatedness to the nature that we were all related and that brings us how are we all related COVID is the obvious that we breathe each other's air but also when we think of the land that we now occupy the common land is Los Angeles where indigenous people are invisible have become invisible as a result of that dispossession but when you look to our mother earth you realize and you should realize that Everything that has gone through the evolution of life and death has just become broken down <clears throat> into this organic matter. When you look at the earth, it is the evidence of millions and millions and millions of different forms of life in our biodiversity on our planet. I do want to say that my presence here is not necessarily as a representative of a tribe because one of the things that we need to release is our human centricity. That is very important that we recall that we all come from tribes. All of us come from tribes. We have lost those indigenous sensibilities. We have forgotten how to dream and how to be, and yes, yes, and all the fear. It is about practicing. My poetry that I read today is uh, one that I want to share is from our U.S. Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo. Joy Harjo is, um, she's a friend, she's a mentor. She's an incredible woman from the Muskogee Creek tribe. And this seemed like the most appropriate thing to read. It's called Remember. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the star's stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give birth. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and her mother's and her mother's. Remember your father, he is your life also. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth. We are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them. Listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind. Remember her voice. She knows the origin of the universe. Remember you are all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember that all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember language comes from this. Remember the dance language is, that life is. Remember. Thank you. May you all go and be well and be safe. Thank you for those beautiful words, Cindy. We appreciate you being with us. 
And again, thank you very much, everyone, for being with us today. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Vanda Shiva. You are absolutely one of my sheroes, along with Lauren Bond, who is definitely one of my sheroes as well. I will leave you guys with a, with a quick uh, uh, sentence that resonates in my life. Let's continue to weave gardens of love, everyone, and stay together. Thank you. Before we close today's session, we would like to invite you for next week's uh, Thursday at 1 p.m. We will be hosting uh, Margaret Wertheimer. And before anyone leaves, we are not going to uh, uh, turn the Zoom off. We would like to he hear everybody say a thing or two, even a goodbye. So we will, be, uh, we will go ahead and unmute everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva. Thank you very much. Brooklyn Rail, Lauren Bond, Cindy L. Vitri, the Metabolic Studio. Everyone be well and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Millie. And uh, next week, we'll be focusing on continuing the conversation on math. Um, Margaret is a science writer and artist and um, writes amazingly well about complex ideas in science. So we're going to continue to think about the interdependence uh, in all things and how it relates to mathematical figures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Abu you. Hai. Salamat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shiva. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Shiva. 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 Thank you, Dr. Sh